Um, you will perish in flames, but uh, that, I took that from Ghostbusters. The, Mark Moranis runs up to the buggy in Central Park and screams to the horse, are you the gatekeeper? Are you the gozer? And then looks up at the driver and says, you will perish in flames and runs off. So I, I think it's perfect, actually, because that is kind of what they're saying. They are saying that the Earth is going to end in flames from climate change. And I'm going to show you why that's not true. Here's where I was born. Some of you have seen this before. I'm sorry if there's a repetition, but I came from this remote float camp on the northwest tip of Vancouver Island where there was no road, and I went to school in a boat every day. But I soon learned city ways, got to UBC, did a PhD in ecology after doing an honors science in biology and forestry. And uh, I'm trying to get back to my hippie roots. <laughs> trying to get the fro back, you know? Because the world's gone crazy, has it not? Have you noticed? There, there, people are saying things that I just don't know how do they think like that. Um, here we are on our first campaign to stop U.S. underground hydrogen bomb tests in the Aleutian Islands. That's what motivated us. At the time, it was the height of the Cold War, the threat of nuclear war, and both Russia and the United States were building more and more nukes every day. This was the, the peak of it. President Nixon, because we did this, canceled the remaining hydrogen bomb tests, and that was the end of H-bomb testing for the United States. We took on the world's largest powerful organization, the United States Atomic Energy Commission, and won. Because the day that bomb went off, tens of thousands of people marched on the Canadian border from north and south and joined hands. And it wasn't until a few months later when the president made his decision. Here I'm sitting on a baby seal off the east coast of Canada. We stopped that too. 250,000 baby seals were being clubbed to death with their mothers. And uh, we didn't think that was right. It wasn't really an issue of extinction or anything. It was just like inhumane. And uh, here we are on the first campaign against the Russian whalers in the North Pacific. We went there in an 85-foot boat 500 miles offshore and got in front of their harpoons. Here we are approaching them for the first time. We took uh, blue jeans, uh, ballpoint pens, and something else. People told us the Russians would like those things if we made you know, gifts to them to show that we were peaceful. And the, the first thing that they ever said to us as we approached their boat, because we were all hippie looking, and uh, they said, hey, you guys got any acid? <laughs> And there I am in front of the harpoon to protect the fleeing whales. And I hope I can do this right. Uh, yes, sound, please. This is the shot that went around the world when we brought this footage into California. This, the zodiac is in the middle, the whale's in front. getting ready to shoot. The only rule we kept was every time they pointed the gun another way, we'd swivel in front of that. And uh, we came up on one wave, and there he was, and we were looking right in the back. I thought we were kind of plugged, like you know, he couldn't possibly shoot. Then we went down, and then that fantastic sound, and you could hear the, of the of the cable. And I guess we both ducked at that point, and I don't know what happened. I was in the boat that filmed this, driving the boat with the cameraman. Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen. That was the introduction at the International Whaling Commission where they pompously sat around and presided over the decisions to how many thousand whales could be killed each year. But that ended. Anyways, I left Greenpeace because it lost its humanitarian orientation. We started out trying to stop nuclear war and it ended up 15 years later, they were calling us the enemies of the earth. And uh, I didn't like that idea that we were some kind of original sin. And uh, they also were peddling junk science for donations. And they are the enemy of nature and civilization at this point in time, along with the World Economic Forum and all these people who are trying to create a world government that has no votes. <laughs>
James talked about the windmills. This is the, what they're going to do on the east coast of the United States. At this point, 1,500 of these wind turbines are proposed. They have to dig a huge hole in the bottom to put a concrete foundation. You can imagine with 5 or 15 megawatts of force on a propeller that you can't just stick these things in the ground like a stick. You have to put a massive base on them. That means excavating 1,500 huge holes in the bottom of the sea in the sediment and muddying the waters for the baleen whales, which feed by straining their food through their baleen. And they also use echolocation, and they ha it would be nice if they could see 10 feet. So this is their migratory route. This is the feeding route for right whales, the humpbacks, of which there are 4,500 there. James mentioned the endangered North Atlantic right whales, but there's 4,500 humpback whales. They go down to Puerto Rico, sorry, uh, DR, Dominican Republic, to uh, breed, to give birth, and, and to breed. But they come back up here every year, and this is where they live. And so this is what's happening. There's a 400% increase in whale deaths on the beaches of the, north, of, of the Atlantic coast that started since 2016. And now they're doing these sonar uh, soundings. Whales are an acoustic animal. They do have eyes, but they can only see a short distance in water. They, they do most of their echolocation by sound. And so this is going to be a lot of sound from these turbines and their construction. Um, oh, there, I've got a, my thing down here. Oh, here's the evolution of us. Homo sapiens is 300,000 years old. That's all. And it's just the tiniest little blip on the top of this chart that shows the history of life on Earth. And these are the key developments. First, there was just water. Then there was single-celled life all the way up to where it says multicellular life near the top. One cell invisible to the eye with no nucleus in it. Then photosynthesis happened where these single cells could use carbon dioxide in the water to get their energy to make sugar. Then eukaryotes means there's a nucleus in the cell. Up until then, the cell was just a package with all stuff floating around inside it. Now a nucleus for the DNA got formed. Multicellular life did not begin until one billion years ago. And then it proliferated. Look how many key points there are up near the top there. Life just went boom. But this is what life looked like for three billion years. That's it. Water with everything invisible. Sponges were the first multicellular life to exist on Earth 600 million years ago. And this was the beginning of anatomy, of different types of tissues developing in species and ending up with us amazingly enough. If you ever get a chance uh, to read this book, I would do so. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould was possibly the greatest evolutionary paleontology guy ever existed. And he, he, he was a prolific writer. He wrote essays every month for 30 years about this sort of thing. And the Burgess Shale is in Canada in Yoho National Park. And you, if you, you, could, you can make a reservation to go there on a hike and see these fossils of 500 million year old species that they're digging out of the shale there. It's a really cool place. This is what life looked like 500 million years ago. There were no creatures with shells yet. Everything was like a jellyfish. The, the, the life forms that existed then, most of them have disappeared forever. Because uh, it was Charles Walcott who discovered the Burgess Shale, and he saw all these fossils, and he tried to place them in the taxonomy that we have today. And he, he just made a lot of mistakes, because there, there is no taxonomy of these things today. They are, they are gone forever, and that's the way it works. Okay, so um, 100 million billion tons of carbon are tied up in carbonaceous rocks in the, in the surface of the earth. Chalk, limestone, dolomite, marble are all of life origin. 
shelled creatures learn to make armor plating for themselves half a billion years ago, many different species. It was such a brilliant thing to do if you were like a jellyfish and you could make a shell for yourself to protect yourself from predation, like a clam, an oyster, a barnacle, a mussel, a crab. All these species figured this out. But they also didn't realize at the time, apparently their IQ was somewhat lower than ours, but actually we didn't figure out what I'm going to tell you next either. They didn't figure out that if they kept taking the CO2 out of the ocean, it would also come out of the air to replace the CO2 they took out of the ocean, and eventually the CO2 would be so low that life would die. This is the truth. A hundred million billion tons of CO2 taken out. Okay, this one's really complicated, but please bear with me. I can't use a pointer here because of the two screens. I've always wanted to be able to do this, but... <laughs> It ain't going to happen. Um, you can see there, uh, just look at the big circle first. Here is a 200, and 200 million year period where CO2 and temperature, CO2 being the purple line, temperature being the blue line, where they are completely out of sync. They are going in opposite directions for 200 million years. This does not indicate a cause-effect relationship. I agree that CO2 is a greenhouse gas, but it is maybe 2% compared to water. And water is the greenhouse gas. And also the ice reflects and the clouds reflect, hold heat in down and reflect light back up. Clouds are the wild card in this whole thing. And so we just do not know why this pattern exists. We don't know why these ice ages happened. See, on the very far right, that's our ice age, the Pleistocene that we're in now. The irony of this whole thing is it's colder now than it has been nearly in the whole history of the Earth, except for the second one, the middle blue arrow pointing up to the Karoo. It was 100 million years long, an ice age that lasted 100 million years. Ours is only 2.6 million years old. It appears as though we are already at the beginning of the 80,000 year slide into the next glacial maximum. These are 100,000 year cycles. I'll get to that. Anyways, I, oh, oh, see where it says on the bottom left, most hard coal produced here. See how CO2 went down precipitously where it had been at 6,000 ppm. The theory is that it went down because trees evolved and started sucking vast more amounts of CO2 out of the atmosphere than had ever happened before. If you think of the world's biomass, most of it is forests. Trees and all the other plants in forests are at least 90% of the biomass on the planet. So suddenly, 10 times as much CO2 was coming down every year to grow the trees when lignin was invented. Plants invented lignin which is like the concrete in a reinforced concrete column with the cellulose, which had been around for billions of years, acting as the rebar, and the concrete is the, is the lignin. The lignin is the concrete. They are perfectly analogous. The trees can bend in the wind, so can a skyscraper. And that's exactly, so it took us three billion years later, no, sorry, trees, 300 million years later, we figured out how to make a reinforced concrete column, whereas they figured it out with organic matter 300 million years ago. And then there was no enzyme that could digest lignin. It was made by the, by the trees. They started growing up, and when they died, nothing could eat them. Oh, first I'll get into correlation versus causation. Um, shark attacks and ice cream sales are far more correlated than CO2 and temperature. It is a fact. That's, that's because many apparent cause-effect relationships, correlations, are the result of a third different independent factor, in this case temperature. People go to the beach in the summer, have an ice cream, go swimming, and some of them get attacked by a shark. In the winter, nobody gets attacked by a shark, and there's not much ice cream sales. So it's, it's perfect. 
There's a website, go to this website called Spurious Correlations. It's just brilliant. Number of people who drowned by falling into a pool correlates with films Nicolas Cage appeared in. <laughs> right? And, and there are thousands of more correlations than there are causations. So remember to check it out and make sure you've got it right when you're blaming one thing on another. So these lush forests evolved in the Carbonaceous period and the Permian, and they formed massive coal seams. 50% of all the coal was created before there was anything that could digest lignin. So the trees just piled up on top of each other to hundreds or maybe even thousands of feet deep and became compressed and formed these coal seams. There was coal made after that as trees got buried by different means. But it would appear that that is what happened. And this is the species that first invented lignase to digest lignin in wood. Because wood is mostly lignin. The cellulose is a, is a smaller proportion of the wood. And these guys invented lignase and then it spread. Like in the stomach of cows there are bacteria that have this property in them to digest cellulose and lignin, both. So a whole world changed when that happened. And then as, as I showed you before, CO2 came way back up again from almost as low as it is now to 2,500 ppm and then gradually declined. I can't tell you enough things in this short period of time. Uh, anyways, there's the recent history from 65 million years. This is a, just a blip in the full time of life, but it's a really important one because as you can see, we are not in a warm period today. We have gone from the Eocene thermal maximum to the Pleistocene ice age, which we are in now, and they're trying to tell us it's too hot. Surely to goodness people could understand something like this. They're, they're not even paying any attention, obviously, to what the real history of the Earth is. Here's the Pleistocene Ice Age, it's starting in the middle there, as, it, as we descended into this freezing cold period called the, the, the Pleistocene Ice Age. And as you can see, at the bottom, there's where people evolved, and it's still getting colder. This ice age might get colder than it is now, because the, the, the other ones did, the 100 million year one did. So there's no indication that the Earth is going to start warming on an average basis in any time soon, like in the next million years. It, it would be pretty obvious from this graph, as you see where CO2 has gone as a result of our emissions on the far right. The temperature didn't follow it. As a matter of fact, the three previous interglacial periods, which are named, there's 42 interglacial periods going back to the beginning of the Pleistocene. Most of them don't have names, but they did have the courtesy to name the three before our, the one we're in now, the Holocene. They're all warmer. The sea level was much higher in all of those, and polar bears survived through those because polar bears started to evolve long before 300,000 years ago. They are descended from the Eurasian brown bear, the polar bear, and if it wasn't for climate change, there would be no polar bears. If it wasn't for the fact that the earth cooled and the ice came down to the no northern Russian coast and the brown bears went out and found seals to eat and then turned into polar bears, which took probably half a million years. They can still breed with brown bears and grizzly bears. Grizzly bears and Eurasian brown bears are the same species. They came across the land bridge when we did. This is Al Gore talking about how high the CO2 has gone. But he knows that temperature change precedes CO2 by an average of 800 years in these cycles. You have to tweeze it out by taking each sample. This is like compressing a whole lot of data when you look at it like this. 
But the fact is, it is the temperature that causes the oceans to warm and give off CO2 and then cool and reabsorb the CO2. That is the scientific truth. You take a glass of cold water out of a fridge and put it on your counter, small bubbles begin to form in it as it warms. That's the gases coming out. Put it back in the fridge, the bubbles are reabsorbed by the water. It's a common knowledge among people who study gases in water. Not too many of them. This is the present situation from 5,000 years ago. We are clearly in a descent on average of temperature on the Earth. The Little Ice Age is about the coldest, along with the Dark Ages, the coldest it had been for 10,000 years. And it's going down. So we don't have to worry too much about it, and neither do our grandchildren. But that's the 80,000 year descent beginning. And this one is my favorite, actually. This is a temperature record by thermometer from when the thermometer was invented in central England, away from the sea. It's, I think, three different sites were combined to form this record. The black line is annual CO2 emissions. It has not had any effect whatsoever on the temperature. Otherwise, the temperature would follow it up, just like in Al Gore's graph there. The temperature would go up. Look at the period back before we even started using fossil fuels, where the temperature increase and length of time was a little bigger than the one that occurred just recently. So there's, there's no evidence here whatsoever that CO2 is doing anything to the temperature. Absolutely none. And this January, the average temperature was in fact 0 0.04 degrees lower than the 1991 to 2020 average. So these ups and downs and ups and downs, there's cycles within cycles within cycles within cycles, and they all have different periods, and they don't make sense to us many times. They don't make sense to us. But we do make sense out of the fact that the temperature has been gradually rising for 300 years since the Little Ice Age got the coldest it was, and CO2 has not had any effect on the rate of temperature change through that 300-year period. I don't know how they get away with it. Oh, this is, this is one of my favorite ones. This was the Global Carbon Project 2010. They've somehow disappeared from Earth, but uh, they did a really nice job here. This shows how many million, sorry, billion tons of CO2 there is, of carbon there is, as CO2 and as plants and as soil and as the Earth's crust. And there's the 100 million billion tons of carbonaceous rocks in the Earth's crust. I came back to this again. I just wanted to show you some cool things. Not many people know that the White Cliffs of Dover are made with the skeletons of microscopic coccolithophores, which are an algae that has learned to make those beautiful shells for themselves so that they can pull water in and take the CO2 out of it and make sugars because they're photosynthesizers. But they've made a, a armor plating for themselves so that the little fish can't just come along and gobble them up so easy. It's, it, this, this is pure coccolithophore shells. I don't know what people think it is, but nobody knows that, it appears. And here the foraminifera are about the size of a tiny grain of sand. They are an animal, and they make all these different shaped shells. They're all foraminifera, forams, as the students of them are called. Five minutes? Uh, four minutes, oh, for Pete's sakes. <laughs> Coral reefs have produced 50% of all the calcium carbonate that has become chalk, limestone, dolomite, and marble. These are 100,000 species of mollusks, including shellfish, octopi, and squid. Nearly all produce carbon calcium calcium carbonate shells. And crustaceans have a different way to make shells. It's, it's got more uh, lignin-type uh, lignin material in it. Um, here's what would have happened if we hadn't come along and put CO2 back into the atmosphere where it came from in the first place. Every molecule of CO2 that we put in the atmosphere came from the atmosphere in the first place, or from the oceans into the atmosphere. Every molecule. 
We are not doing anything new. We are simply putting it back where it came from. Oh, cool. Here's this. This is the Royal Horticultural Society saying that the reason plants grow better is because you talk to them. <laughs> no. It's because you are breathing CO2 on them. 50,000 parts per million instead of the ambient 420. And they don't know that. And they never will, apparently. Now just quickly, forest fires. This is what happens when you're stupid. And then you die. Building a suburb in a pine forest, which is pitchy and catches on fire real easy. As a matter of fact, the trees did better than the houses, didn't they? Because they're used to fire. This is what they did. This is what you should do when trees are near buildings. Do not plant coniferous ones. Plant broadleaf trees that aren't pitchy. And leave open areas. Be selective in what you do. This is never going to have a catastrophic wildfire. This is. I just in Oregon where 400,000 hectares of, of uh, acres of forest were burnt, half the trees were killed, approximately. They left all the dead trees standing for the last five years to dry out. And when the next fire starts, it'll kill all the rest of the live trees. This is not forest management. Most of the federal land is west of the Mississippi. National forests, national parks, BLM land. Most of the politicians are east of the Mississippi. <laughs> so they can make rules about the federal lands in the west that don't affect their own constituents and look all goody-goody about protecting the environment. But what they're doing is these greenies from the inner city, oh, this is just, a, how many of you have seen this? The US Forest Service has exterminated the left-hand side of that graph and said, they, and when asked why, they say, we don't know where the data came from. <laughs> well, where the hell else did it come from but themselves? They're the ones who are looking at the forest fires and forests. They obviously had this data and they've taken it out to make it look like it's getting worse. In 1750, when wood was the only major fuel for heating and everything else, Europe had been reduced to less than 10% forest cover. Today it is 43% because of fossil fuels, making it so you don't have to use wood for everything. That's why. This is the Amazon satellite photo of the Amazon. They say it's all being destroyed every day, rapidly, almost gone. No, less than 10% of it has been turned into agriculture, as if that's an evil pursuit. This is the Congo in Africa. They say the same thing about the Congo. There's no one there to see what's happening, hardly, because people don't go to the Congo for a holiday, and most of them don't go to the Amazon rainforest for a holiday either. Maybe they go up the Amazon River in a boat, and all they'll see is trees the whole way they go. The earth is greening due to CO2. This is the main thing that the CO2 is doing, is greening the earth, making our agriculture more productive, etc. And that's my talk. Please buy my book, Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom.